This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 104 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. If you are brand new to the podcast, certainly I am extremely glad that you have found us, and I do hope that this is helpful to you. And if you are a longtime listener, thank you so much for your support and for coming back week after week to hear me blather on about homesteading. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, when I say beautiful upstate New York, it has been absolutely gorgeous so far this fall relatively warm. I think it's supposed to be up in the 70s all of this coming week. And uh, I'm just really, really enjoying it. Now, if you're somebody who loves the cool, crisp nights, and I don't mind those, I honestly don't. I, I, you know, I like the cool, crisp nights and, you know, maybe a mug of mulled cider or some hot tea or some hot cocoa uh, sitting around a crackling campfire. I enjoy that part of fall. But these warmer days have really lent themselves to me being able to get some stuff done here on the homestead. And so for that, I am very, very grateful. So let's just jump on over to this week's homestead happenings, and I'll bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on the homestead. So here on the homestead, the garden season is starting to wind down. And for that, I am thankful. Uh, I have a few more tomatoes to pick, but by and large, the tomato season is over. And I've got to say, I'm glad. (laughs) So I did go ahead and pull out all of the tomatoes that I had in the freezer And I turned them into just plain old tomato sauce. No seasonings, no, no, nothing. That's a double negative, right? So nothing in them, (laughs) no spices, just straight up tomato sauce. Um, and, And I did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, this year's take on the seasoned tomato sauce just isn't as good as last year's. I'm not quite sure what I did differently or why that is, Um, but I I wasn't as happy with how that turned out as as I was with last year's seasoned sauce. But the other thing as well is that when you do just a plain Jane tomato sauce, then when you go to use it, you really have a lot more options. So you can use that as the base to make tomato soup, Uh, You can use that as the base to make pizza sauce. You can use that as the base to make tomato sauce. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do with it if you don't add any herbs to it. If you just can up that tomato sauce, um, it just allows you quite a bit of flexibility. And so that's what uh, I've been doing a lot of today. Uh, I'm recording this actually Saturday evening. I'll explain why here in a second. But uh, I spent a good part of the day utilizing the Squeezo with my upgrade, uh, the DeWalt drill connected to it. And boy, can you run some tomatoes through that puppy. Uh, And so I ended up with two full canner loads of tomato sauce. So 18 pints a piece uh, in each canner. And then a quart of uh, tomato sauce that we'll just put in the fridge. And uh, this coming week, my wife will use it for something. And so, yeah, it was just, uh, it was a busy day doing that. And I did a few other things that we'll talk about here in a minute, but I am just glad that uh, by and large, the tomato season is done. I did not do any crushed tomatoes or whole tomatoes or anything like that. We had plenty of those left over from last year. Uh, And so this year it was a focus on the season sauce because we liked it so much last year. This year, uh, not quite so much. And then uh, taking a 
Well, this is the first time I've ever done the, the non seasoned tomato sauce, but knowing that it gives us that level of flexibility is the reason why I went that direction. And so hopefully it will work out well for us. The other thing that uh, happened this week uh, is that we took our turkeys to the processor. I do not process my own turkeys for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, I don't have kill cones that are big enough to hold the turkeys. And secondly, I don't have a plucker that would be able to handle the turkeys of the size that we have a tendency to raise. And so I had uh, one turkey that I think dressed out around 30 pounds. Uh, everybody else was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 22 to 25 pounds. And I actually had them do some of my turkeys in their smokehouse. And folks, oh, I just can't wait to eat those turkeys because I've had them before. I wasn't able to get any smoked last year and it is just so delicious. And so I had two of the turkeys smoked cut in half because we just can't handle a, a whole turkey. The three of us, in fact, a half of turkey really is pushing it for the three of us. So we will have lots and lots of leftovers. Um, and then what I also did is um, I cut up the turkeys for my mom and dad. So my mom and dad right now are on vacation. And so they wanted uh, a couple of turkeys, which I raised for them, but uh, they do not have room in their freezer for half turkeys, certainly not whole turkeys. And so I went ahead and cut them into parts uh, today and used their food saver. And folks, let me tell you something. I, I was in love. Um, I'm not usually somebody who falls in love with gadgets, but uh, that is one that uh, I, I've, I've kind of, in the back of my mind, I've wanted to get a vacuum sealer, um, but I just haven't done it yet. And now that I've used theirs, whew, I tell you folks, that thing is just absolutely amazing. Um, I, I was just so shocked with, uh, with how well it worked. And so... I'm not quite sure whether or not I'm going to go ahead and buy one of my own or, you know, as they say, possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> so mom and dad, when you want to borrow your food saver, come get it. Uh, speaking of borrowing things and uh, returning them to the rightful owner, uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, borrow. Um, and I, I don't even want to use the term borrow. I guess borrow it really was lent to me on a long-term loan. Uh, a friend of mine, a uh, buddy by the name of Andy, had a chicken scalder. And uh, several years ago, he came over and helped me butcher chickens. And he brought his scalder with him. And then he just said to me, he said, at the time they were living in an apartment, they were trying to get a house built. He really didn't have a place to store it. And he said, why don't I just leave this with you? And uh, then when, um, you know, when I need it, I'll come get it. And uh, so that's been two or three years. I, I don't even remember how, how long it's been here. And uh, so a couple of weeks ago, he, uh, he reached out to me and he said, hey, could I borrow that scalder? <laughs> <laughs> said, uh, dude, it's your scalder. I mean, of course. So uh, I went ahead and uh, actually took the scalder over to Andy's house uh, yesterday evening. And uh, it was it was so awesome to, to see their homestead. Um, I hadn't been over there in, in quite a quite a while. And I tell you, folks, uh, they just have an absolutely the Defoe family farm is just absolutely gorgeous. So beautiful. Um, they're doing such a great job there. And uh, Andy and Marissa actually bought some pigs off of me uh, back in the spring. And so it was great to see those pigs and folks, they're just looking so wonderful. They're looking so, I mean, just so healthy and uh, so well taken care of. And it just makes my heart glad to know that, you know, the animals that I have sold off are in such a wonderful, wonderful situation being well taken care of 
and are going to provide nourishment and sustenance to that to to that family. So it was great to catch up with him uh, and see what he's got going on there on their on their farm. And uh, then today, when I took uh, my, I had some customers buy some turkeys from me, and so I, I went to deliver one of them. Uh, to a family that actually also bought some pigs off of me this spring. And uh, so I got to see those pigs. And uh, so it was, it was really great. They looked very, very good as well. And uh, just again, well taken care of in such um, a great uh, situation. And, and again, my heart was warmed and I was very, very happy uh, to see the animals living their best life on um, being so well taken care of. And that's just something that is so important to me. Um, it's something that means so much to me. And so I was, I was so happy to, to actually have that opportunity yesterday and today to be able to kind of catch up with some of these animals. I don't get to do that very often. And uh, so it was very exciting to be able to do that. Now, one of the other things that I did today is I tried out a recipe from the Pure Charcuterie book uh, that Jack and I talked about last week, and that was a pork shank confit. Now, that simply is a fancy way of saying that it is cooked in fat. You basically, you season the, the, uh, the pork shank, um, you let it kind of marinate or cure for a couple of days, and then you cook it in all of this fat. And, uh, and so I did that today and I was so excited and the house was just smelling so good. And then I went to take it out and I realized I had left it in there too long and I had dried it out and it was harder than a rock. And I was so crushed because I had been smelling that and it smelled so good. And I screwed it up, it made me so mad. So we have to try again. <laughs> That's, I guess, what you got to do. Sometimes you learn things the hard way. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of lost track of it with the, all of the stuff I had going on today, trying to butcher, or I should say butcher, although it really was butchering, um, because I'm certainly not a professional meat cutter. But as I was parting out mom and dad's uh, turkeys, and uh, as I was uh, doing the tomato sauce, I kind of lost track of this pork shank confit and uh, messed it up. So uh, it is what it is. And we'll try again. One last thing I wanted to share with you. Uh, if you follow us on Facebook uh, or Instagram, now this full video did only go out on Facebook because it was too long for Instagram. And I haven't quite figured out how videos work on Instagram. It's I throw pictures up there and share them on both places, but video is a little more challenging. But uh, I shared on our Facebook page. So definitely, if you don't follow us there, uh, you know, give us a like, a follow, and uh, it'll keep you up to date with what we're doing. But last night, I harvested our sweet potatoes. I was so excited, folks, because I actually was able to grow sweet potatoes this year. You may remember last year, I tried planting sweet potatoes three times, and I think I had one slip actually take and I got maybe one potato last year. Now I did that up in the Ruth Stout bed. I wasn't quite sure if it was the weather because it was so dry last year, if it was the Ruth Stout bed, if it was a combination of the two, if it was a location, just wasn't quite sure what went wrong. And so this year I decided that I was going to move the sweet potatoes up into the raised beds. And so I planted 24 potato, sweet potato slips. And I think all of them took off. And we had vines, folks. Beautiful, beautiful vines. If you want to see the abundant harvest that was not, head on over to Facebook and watch that video. Trust me, folks, when I tell you, though, it was far from an abundant harvest. Oh, I was so mad. So if you have any tips on growing sweet potatoes, uh, I am all ears. I know in the Northeast, it is a little bit more challenging to grow sweet potatoes. They like heat. It definitely wasn't a hot summer. It was a wet summer, a little on the cooler side. So I think that really is what it was. But maybe it was the wrong variety. I don't really remember if they were. I think they might have been Georgia Jets. Maybe I need a different variety. So if you've got sweet potato knowledge and you've got especially 
sweet potato knowledge on how to grow sweet potatoes in the Northeast, hit me up, Brian at the homesteadjourney.net. Uh, I would love to hear from you so I can successfully grow sweet potatoes next year. I am again recording this on Saturday um, because tomorrow night, those who are members of the supporting listeners program for the Homestead Journey podcast, we're going to be having kind of a family reunion tomorrow evening. And that's normally when I record the podcast. And so I pulled it into Saturday so that I don't have to worry. We can just have a great time tomorrow evening. And if that's something that's of interest to you, if you're interested in becoming a member of the Supporting Listeners Program, head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net for more information. But my plans for tomorrow are to take those carcasses that I have left uh, from breaking down mom and dad's turkeys and cooking them down into broth and maybe getting that canned up. Uh, and I've got a few other projects that I need to tackle outside. And so we will see what tomorrow brings. Um, and who knows, maybe I'll just take it easy and chill on the couch. <laughs> nah, ain't nobody got time for that. All right, folks, let's head on over to this week's Charting the Course. On today's Charting the Course, I actually have another interview. So this is going to be something kind of a little bit unorthodox for the Homestead Journey podcast. Uh, three interviews in a row. So we had Carl from the Self-Sufficient Hub. Last week, we had Jack Polner from the Mindful Homestead joining me as we kind of geeked out for about an hour about charcuterie. And today, I am so blessed and lucky and uh, just honored to have joining me Meredith Lee, uh, who is the one who actually taught the charcuterie intensive that Jack and I attended a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who don't know, Meredith is a consultant, a freelance writer, and a thought leader in agriculture and food systems, and has been working towards integrity in the food supply chain for 17 years. She lives with her family in Asheville, North Carolina. She is a chef, an author, a butcher, uh, and a charcuterie master. Uh, and so with all of that said, Meredith, welcome to the program. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. So I think it's on Discovery Channel. They have, what is it, Shark Week? And here on the podcast, it kind of feels like we're doing charcuterie week. There you go. I like it. I've never had anyone riff off of Shark Week. What a great idea. Well, you know, every once in a while, I don't know, maybe it's a bad pun, but uh, last week, Jack and I really um, had a great time, uh, you know, kind of chatting about the, uh, the, the great event we had there in, in Massachusetts. And, uh, and so it's just such a pleasure to have you here on the program. I'm so appreciative of you taking time out of your business schedule to join me here. Oh, well, thanks. I'm excited to, to chat and see what comes up. You know, I, you and Jack were great additions to that class. It's always good to have the curious ones, you know, who, and who feel adventurous and want to try things. And, you know, Jack, Jack was like running around, dipping his finger in all the pots, you know, <laughs> throughout the weekend. And, and his, uh, you know, when we did the uh, sausage uh, thing, he definitely went uh, uh, a bit of a different direction than everybody else did. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, what I thought we would do is kind of start at the beginning for you, because your journey um, into kind of what you do now is a very, very unique one. And it's one that I think, you know, to have somebody who is now teaching charcuterie and whole animal butchery and really um, beating the, the drum of ethical meat, as I have the book here in my hot <laughs> little hand. Um, mm -hmm. your, your background, I think, would, would surprise a lot of people. So just kind of start at the beginning for me. Um, well, I grew up, I guess, in this city, and I wasn't very connected to food. So that's probably important to the story because I, I was a vegetarian not as a child, but as 
in high school, you know, when you start to kind of find your mind and you're like getting passionate about stuff. And, you know, I was properly politically aggravated and, and uh, outraged at the world. And so I think that for somebody who doesn't understand farming is living in an urban environment and seeing kind of how messed up things tend to be in, in our system, then, you know, vegetarian and veganism is a really popular choice. You know, it's a really, it feels like you're doing something, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was definitely one of those vegetarians for a while, you know, who was real convinced that everybody needed to be a vegetarian and didn't, you know, have any qualms with sharing that opinion with whoever did or did not want to hear it. Um, (laughs) And, you know, definitely was humbled over time, particularly because I ended up getting a scholarship to go to a school called Warren Wilson College, which is here where I live now in the Asheville, North Carolina region. Um, And it's like a, it started, origins are as a farm school. Um, And I was like a city kid. I didn't know anything about farming. I didn't know anything about growing food. My mom was a single mom. We ate from the freezer. We went to fast food, you know, whatever, typical like 80s kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, went to this farm school, mostly because I got a check to do it. You know what I mean? And I got there. And one of the things that you had to do at that school and still have to do is you do a little work in the community. So I ended up taking this job at a a little garden that was at a high school. And it was the first time that I was really like thrust into the soil, you know, that everything comes from the soil. And, Mm -hmm. and it was really transformational for me. Um, And I went into school as a creative writing and English major. But when I took on that work, I realized that that was really what I wanted to write about. And so I really threw myself into agriculture and was still, still a vegetarian. At that point, I think I was vegan and I started farming, got some land, started farming and was growing vegetables and growing flowers. And, you know, what changed for me is like really a couple of things, traveling to other parts of the world where I witnessed farming that was super integrated. So it wasn't like vegetables are over here and animals are over here. Like it is in America that everything was dependent on everything else. And it was Mm -hmm. full circle. And there was just a beauty in that and a sensibility in that and a scientific, you know, whatever reason for it that I had not really necessarily connected. And you know, also realized that like the vegan choice is a really privileged choice, you know, at that point, because I was traveling in the global South, you know, where there are lots of folks who don't have the option of cherry picking their diets. And so that coupled with the fact that I was farming myself and seeing how like we really needed to like lessen inputs and really go full circle on the land if we want it to be truly sustainable, Mm -hmm. you know, it was just like the light bulb started going off, you know, and I, you know, really was faced with an existential moment when I was in Vietnam and this woman that I had become friends with, she put a piece of water buffalo into my bowl. And in Vietnam, it's a gesture of friendship to place food in another person's bowl. Mm -hmm. So you're not very well going to be going, I'm vegan. I can't eat that, you know? So I, (laughs) so I basically like, I, I put it in my mouth and ate it, you know, and it wasn't even really a, a moment of hesitation. And that was definitely like the first domino in what would become, you know, full on specialization in farming animals on pasture and then opening a butcher shop and then learning to cut and then making charcuterie and now teaching about charcuterie and really seeing that educational piece and that reskilling piece as like the biggest piece of all, you know, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Wow. So that was probably a really long winded answer to your question. (laughs) No, that's great because I, I think that's so important to really understand Again, the name of the podcast is the Homestead Journey, and and so really, it's that that piece of it really fascinates me. Um, whether it's how people get into homesteading or kind of the directions mm-hmm. people take when they get into homesteading, but really understanding that all of us are on a journey, and sure. whether you know, I I talk a lot about self sufficiency, self reliance, and sustainability here on the podcast. Understanding that none of us are ever going to fully be self-sufficient. None of us are ever going to be fully self-reliant. None of us are right. ever going to be full on sustainable, but it's about what step can I take today in that direction? 
um, mm-hmm. that I think is important. And, and so here in your journey and kind of the steps that have led you to where you are at now, I think is really, it's fascinating, but I think it's also important because I think there are a lot of people who are rightly um, upset with the yeah. way that animals are treated and raised um, and the direction that our food supply has taken. Mm-hmm. And so if we're going to do something about that, um, and if we're going to take back food, then the question then is, how do we do that in a way that is ethical? How do we do that mm-hmm. in a way that honors the animal, that honors tradition? Um, all of those kinds of things, which I think is, I mean, it's something I'm very passionate about. It's something mm-hmm. that I think is very, very important. And so it, you know, again, understanding your, your story, I think really helps frame um, hopefully where this conversation goes today. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting, like part of that, the aggravation or the grabbing for a choice of something to do is like a real, you know, that's often like the first waking up and the first step of awareness. But once you get deeper and deeper into these things, you realize like how systemic all these issues are. I mean, they're the the things that are wrong with the meat and dairy part of the food system are like rampant throughout the food system. So they don't not apply to soy production, Mm -hmm. you know, and they don't not apply to other types of agriculture. And so, you know, there's that piece, you know, it's not just the way the animals are treated. It's the way the land is treated. And it's the way that workers are treated through the supply chain and the way farmers are able to have viable businesses. And it's about global trade and it's about human rights and it's about, um, nutrition and chronic illness. And there's so many things that so will not be solved with a binary decision. You know yes. what I mean? And so I think, yeah, like I, I want to like backtrack to my last statement saying that like the reskilling is like the most important thing. That's like, I don't want to like hold any one thing up as the most important thing. You know, I think that there's obviously many different entry points into, as you say, like, what do I do? And I think, uh, you know, as you said, like the whole self-reliance thing sometimes falls into this tricky category of like, it's the consumer's role or it's the eater's role to fix all these problems. And that's definitely not the answer. Like really the bulk of what is at hand with the food system is the fact that it's based on like a colonial cultural mindsets that need to be reshaped and also corporate domination. And so like, the thing about reskilling is that it gets people back into community and it starts to regionalize like supply chains based on the fact that local knowledge is being rebuilt and um, local interdependency is like showing itself right on the surface. And so I think you're right. I love what you say. Like no one's ever going to be self-reliant, but you are going to have the knowledge and the skills to help yourself and your neighbor and recognize that you're interdependent with the land and the people that are in proximity with you. Right. That absolutely. That's, that's so important. It's one of those things that maybe, you know, I, you know, I going down this charcuterie rabbit hole and, and loving it, but you know, my next door neighbor may not be interested at all in that. And so maybe my role is to do the charcuterie thing and my neighbor is doing the vegetable thing. I mean, you know, whatever, however it all works out. Um, but yeah, that we kind of collaborate, we work together. Uh, one of the things I think that, and I'm, I, you know, the, we're, we're not past the COVID thing and, and I need, I hate to even bring the COVID thing up, but I, I, I think that it's, if anything good has come out of the COVID thing, it's that I think there are people who have woken up to the fact that our food system is so broken. Um, and that you know, well, certainly, yes, there is this global supply chain and and, and there are going to be certain things that I'm never going to be able to grow here in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm never going to be able to grow citrus here, um, not without some kind of a special, um, you know, setup. So understanding that, yes, there is a global piece, a global component to it, but maybe instead of me relying on pork from China, maybe instead I should be relying on pork from my neighbor down the road or if you can raising, raising pork yeah. in my backyard, if I have that opportunity and mm-hmm. understanding that not everybody can, that's right. Um, but everybody, I, I do believe that everybody can do something. Um, 
Well, it's kind of like you said, you know, you, you hit at a point that's really important about being a community with people and not everyone brings the same knowledge and not everyone brings the same skills, you know, and that's one way that you can start to subvert like these issues because then you can share with each other and it's not about like monetary trade, like it's not about money. And so then you can, in some way by sharing labor, by sharing knowledge and other resources, then you open up accessibility to other people in your community who might not have accessibility through the normal channels of like farmers markets or, you know, individual relationships with farmers are raising their own animals. And I think that we're seeing more of that like mutual aid cropping up in, in homesteading communities. And as a result of COVID, you know, and I think the other interesting point is people recognizing that the food system isn't not that it's broken, it's working very well for certain people, right? And, but then by design, it was by design that it was created that way. And therefore it's not serving a huge swath of people. And that swath of people that it's not serving continues to grow and grow and grow as time passes and as resources are depleted by the system itself. And so I think, you know, there will be, you know, COVID is just one example of the challenges that we're going to be facing going forward that are going to force people to get, you know, into community or to root back to their themselves. Um, And so I think, you know, classes and stuff, it's, it's interesting. Like I, you know, you might remember me opening the class by saying that, like, I don't own any of this knowledge and I didn't invent this kind of knowledge. And I have like my own internal conflict about suddenly being the one who's like out in the world sharing it, you know, and um, that's certainly a slippery slope at the same time, like all the time and investment that I put into synthesizing everything that I've learned and witnessed, you know, is definitely something that has come at a cost to me, you know, but at some point I feel like, you know, this is common knowledge. This is everybody or used to be, and this is everybody's right, you know? And so how do we, how do we create enough networks of knowledge to where this becomes common again and accessible again to mm-hmm. anybody who, who needs it? Right. And, and I, um, that's something that Jack and I talked about last week um, was, you know, the fact that you are open about, um, you know, kind of that internal struggle and, and, uh, and both he and I feel very, very strongly that you are honoring the past by doing what you're doing, because if, if people like you are not out there pushing this message forward, who's going to do it. Right. And, you know, to your point, you have invested in, in acquiring this knowledge and, and putting it all together. Um, and now you're willing to share that for sure. Um, but on the, uh, on the other hand, you know, you still have to put food on your table. You still have to have a roof right. over your head. And so truly really trying to find that balance of how to do that in a way where it's still accessible to people, but mm-hmm. you're still able to meet your needs. Certainly. I understand where that is, uh, you know, is going to be a bit of a juggling act for you. It's a good bit of tension. Yeah. yeah. But on the other but hand, the fact like... that you recognize that I think is awesome. Yeah, I think so. Cause I think it's like you know, there, there will be, and there probably are people who are more, who have more of a right to be returning this knowledge than me. And, and I would say specifically like women of color would be those people because, you know, all the research I've done is like that this kind of knowledge, like preservation or like the ethical side or the spiritual, sometimes the ethics and spirituality don't have to be combined, but in indigenous cultures very much was combined mm-hmm. in the mythology and the, and the spiritualism of it. Right. And so it was like the women who were saying the prayers and giving the men the prayers to go and take on the hunt with them, you know, and so all these things, all these ideas that allow us to like really reconcile some of the messed some of the messed up associations we have with death that make eating animals hard for us, like bringing back the cultural, like understanding of how we exist as a predator species on this planet. Like it comes with, you need that cultural side. You need that, that ethical side, you need that spiritual side. Right. And it was, it was the sort of the, the, the knowledge of women, you know, and then furthermore, like, you know, if, if the warriors or whatever are going out and hunting or bringing in the animals, 
And of course there were definitely societies where women were involved in that too. Um, but like once the animal came back, the tanning of the hides, the preservation of the meat, you know, that was largely in many societies, women's work, you know? And so if we think about colonialism being this like thing that depends on, on the extraction of resources and people's labor and also the erasure of their knowledge and culture, then we can see very clearly how our food system has become this thing that has not only feeds us crap, but also like trains us to be in this mindset that doesn't include all of that spiritual ethical mm -hmm. framework. Right. And so, you know, there are women out there who are, who have like genetic ties is what I'm saying to that, that cultural legacy. And I'm not as a white woman, one of those people, you know what I mean? And so it's interesting for me to think about that, but I do think, you know, um, in some ways I see myself sort of running myself out of business in terms of like teaching this class, because I think eventually as more and more people are reskilling either because they've learned from me or somebody else, you know, then the rightful bearers of this knowledge will eventually rise, you know, to be the ones that are really giving us that like truly full circle understanding of what it means to do ethical meat. That's my highest goal, you know? Yeah. And I understand where you're coming from. I, I would, I would take a little bit, I guess, of issue with that in that, you know, it, it, I guess you go back, you, you, you seek to go back, like how far do you go back where that knowledge came from some, some other place? You know what I'm saying? You, you sometimes if, if you start thinking about that, you know, that, that tribe brought that not maybe got that knowledge from some other place. Um, and, and so there's a sense to where I feel like not, not to say that you appropriate it, but as you seek to honor that and you seek to carry that forward and you do that in a way that is honorable and ethical, I think to a certain extent you gain to say a right, maybe that's the wrong word, but a privilege, to, to carry that forward and, and to, to, to have the honor of kind of recognizing that if, if I don't speak this, speak this forward, these skills and this knowledge could very well be lost. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I really feel like what you're doing is, is, um, it, it's just, it's honorable, it's admirable. And, and I, you know, I, while I understand your kind of internal struggle, um, <laughs> you know, from, or I should say, I understand it, but, um, as yeah, much I as I can mean. understand it, you know, yeah, totally. um, you know, you, you pushing this forward. I, I just, I, I feel like it is such a great way to honor the past. Um, well, I hope and, so. And I'm really excited to see like everybody from your class is super busy. Like they're like, going forward with all these projects it's really really fun to to keep in touch you know and to see how people's projects are going and I think you ended up you ended up with a copa what did you do yeah I have a copa I still have got yeah. it I've still got it sitting in the fridge so I've got to get on oh, okay that. I've got to get yeah. on that and I also <laughs> still have carrying a, it, it still is and I still I have uh the pork shank or not I'm sorry trotters um oh that I am, I've got the uh, four spice on it. Okay. Right? And uh, so I'll be doing that up tomorrow night for dinner. Um, in okay. the, uh, in the, I want to say sous vide. It's not sous vide. What is it? It's um, when you do it in the fat. Oh my goodness gracious. Confit. Confit. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably had some shank on there too. Not just shank. the feet. Yeah. Yes. I'm that. sorry. It's yeah, a shank. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So. Those are going to be delicious. Yeah. So I'm, I'm totally stoked about that. So that's going to be, um, that that's going to be dinner tomorrow night and I'm trying to remember what else my wife is pairing with that. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be, it's going to be a good, good dinner tomorrow night. So, yeah. yeah. And, and do you have pigs on your property? I do. So I have American guinea yeah. hogs. Um, that's how oh, I right. got, that's right. That's how I got kind of connected with okay. uh, Seth and, uh, yeah. I've done my, I've done a little bit of you know, uh, attempts at charcuterie. I actually have a couple of, um, uh, prosciuttos hanging in the basement right now. Um, that oh, I fun. did in a salt box. Uh, actually my first attempt was like three years ago and I let it hang for like 18 months. Um, mm -hmm. and we had it at Christmas last year. And so then, um, I felt like I kind of let it hang maybe a little bit too long. 
Um, mm. So we. It was hard, like really hard. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. because they're such a small animal. And then I was, yeah. I was harvesting these animals at a, at a young age. They were actually um, borlets that I um, couldn't castrate because they only had one testicle. Oh. Um, so I wanted to harvest them early so they didn't taint. And so they were, you know, a smaller version of an already smaller pig. So you're, <laughs> you're dealing with yeah. a small ham to begin with. So all of that to say that we hung these last year around Christmas time. And so we'll be enjoying them around Christmas time this year. Um, Fun. and then I've tried like some duck, duck breast prosciutto, which didn't come out all that great. Um, <laughs> I've tried, uh, oh, I did bacon last year. Um, I cold smoked and hot smoked some bacon. Um, nice. and, uh, that came out really, really good. That was, that was probably my best thing so far. So I've dabbled in it, but certainly, as I said, in, in the initial kind of round of question at the class, my biggest fear in all of this is killing somebody. Yeah. Um, and so that was one of the things that I came away with, uh, from the class, a, a confidence that, mm-hmm. you know, if I follow a few basic principles and steps, uh, mm-hmm. and, and follow my senses and, you know, kind of make sure that uh, I'm being smart about stuff, uh, right. I might make somebody a little sick, but I shouldn't kill anybody. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're going to, you know what I mean? And I don't think you're going to make people sick unless you're just like, being really, really, um, sloppy about mm-hmm. your, and dirty about your work. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But if you're, everybody wants to have a clean kitchen when you go to cook something, you know, same, same principle, mm-hmm. keep your surfaces clean, keep your, keep your equipment cold, keep your meat cold. You'll be fine. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that, that really was probably, um, fr- from my perspective, not, not my, my biggest takeaway. And yet on the other hand, just kind of having that confidence to come out and mm-hmm. say, okay, I can, I, you know, I can do this. Totally. Um, and, uh, so that, that, that really was, was huge for me. So you actually, at one point in time, um, you had a butcher shop, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, a restaurant, I think that was connected to the butcher shop. So tell me just a little bit about how you got into doing that. Sure. Um, so again, I was farming commercially. So I was selling my products, you know, as opposed to homesteading where you're mostly just producing it for yourself or your community. Um, and so what that involves for folks who are not involved in commercial um, animal production is that you have to have all your animals processed at a USDA slaughter facility or state inspected slaughter facility if you want to resell the meat um, you know, later. And so those costs are some of the highest costs in small scale meat production. And there's a huge bottleneck in that area, as we saw when COVID hit, because they're really that infrastructure for regional meat processing has been slowly broken down over the years because the meat industry itself has been vertically integrating and consolidating to where, you know, four or five companies own all the meat packing, um, for most of the meat that is on the market in the U.S. Yeah, one um, of the and things, so, there, there's a statistics I saw, and I don't remember exactly the number, but I'm wanting to say back in like 1954, there were about 10,000 meat processing mm-hmm. plants across the United States. And now yeah. we're down to just over a thousand. That's including state um, certified and USDA. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And it's not just in the meat in the meat industry, it's in the grain processing Mm -hmm. industry. You know, it's like all throughout our food processing infrastructure has been abandoned or changed into something else. And so that's another thing that's, you know, even if small scale business owners are trying to reclaim like a smaller scale slaughterhouse, a lot of times they're working with, you know, at this point, 70 year old infrastructure, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's very risky in addition to all the regulation and really capital intensive issues that go with getting into the processing industry. There's also just the aged um, buildings and equipment and all the things, you know, and so mm-hmm. it's just a lot, but so it, it ends up being an expensive business to be in. And that because of a lot of different factors, those, um, costs have to be turned over to the farmer. Um, and so, you know, we found that we were paying over half of our gross profits to our processor. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that was what um, inspired us to work under an exemption in you know, the meat processing code that basically allows us to operate at the county level of inspection as a restaurant, but that would allow us to um, bring in whole animals that had been just slaughtered, which is like usually a flat fee as opposed to the per pound cut and wrap fee that you incur if you're getting your animals processed for sales of freezer meat. Um, So we were paying just the kill fee and then we were bringing the whole animals into the butcher shop and cutting them up ourselves and making our own sausages and then selling them to the consumer. So that's a model that a lot of the butcher shops that you see coming up in small towns today are following. Um, and, And it's really great because not only do you put more of those processing dollars into your own pockets, but you also can usually offer your customers a wider range of products um, because a lot of these processing build facilities just have like a few different sausage recipes, for example, that they use for all of their customers. Whereas if you're making your own, you can customize and, you know, create your own trade secrets and things like that. Um, and so then we had a little restaurant, which was mostly just like a sandwich shop. And we made prepared dinners at that point. Um, now, and I'm not affiliated with it anymore, but now it's a full on seated restaurant with a full whole animal butcher program. Um, but the, the sandwich shop is really just like us trying to be clever about waste stream management. Because if you think about it, you have like a, a case full of perishable, highly perishable meats and a customer base that's still like just learning how to buy the whole animal. Like they're coming in, they're like, I want filet mignon, I want ribeyes. You still got the freaking, you know, shoulder meat or the, you know, the flank or whatever later. So why don't we make a few Philly cheesesteaks and send them out as cooked food because we know how to tenderize the meat or we know how to cook it. Right. And so, um, that was kind of our model and it was really interesting on a lot of levels because not only was it just a whole other business that we had to learn, but the other thing was like to meet the demand, we were buying in animals from other people. And so it wasn't just our animals, it was other people's stock. And it was just really fascinating for me to see the difference in the carcass quality based on the feed regimen or based on where they were getting their slaughtering done or all the different things. And that's when I just really started to go all the way full circle with this. And also realizing that in order to really use that whole animal and get it out the door, like we had to incorporate some kind of charcuterie, some kind of preservation. And so I had to figure that knowledge out. Um, But the other thing is that that model is still subject to a lot of regulation that's super prohibitive for small scale producers. And so the other thing I realized is like, I don't necessarily want to be in this business because I find it too limiting. You know, it's at that point in time, meat inspectors were, and even restaurant inspectors were really uneducated about fermented meats. Um, And they're getting better now because of a lot of amazing people who are doing a lot of work in the field. Um, But it was really difficult to get inspectors on board with some of the stuff that we wanted to do. Um, And so I have been really liberated since I sold that business. Um, Because really what I want is for people to be able to access good food, right? And for, and for it to be, Mm -hmm. for it to not seem like unreachable to them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in the mutual aid. I'm really interested in the loopholes. I'm really interested in the homestead scale. Not that I don't want farmers to succeed. And I do a lot of helping farmers understand how they can market their meat differently or how they can um, merchandise their meat products, you know? But I think where I see the most sort of like real change potential is in like small communities of people who, Mm -hmm. who aren't like, interested in always playing by the rules, you know, I think Mm -hmm. um, most of the more substantial change we've seen to systems in the, in the history of human civilization was because people were willing to push the envelope, break the laws, Mm -hmm. because rules are usually responsive to people's behavior. They're not like preemptive. And so that fascinates me, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that's a little bit about the journey, I guess. Um, from farmer to like butcher to now like homesteader slash like rule breaker free agent. (laughs) I I, I mean, that's, I I love that too. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like totally let's go rogue, you know, how can we, you know, I, I love the fact that you used a restaurant exemption to push forward 
meat processing, you know, you found a loophole and you drove that bus right on through it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we certainly weren't the first ones. That's important to say. I mean, the, um, so we were heavily assisted by, um, the niche meat processors association and also, um, an organization called NC choices that's here in North Carolina that works a lot with like meat post production stuff. And so there are resources for people. Like if you're a farmer or even if you're a homesteader and you're interested in this kind of thing, definitely check out the niche meat processors association and, um, you know, look for the organizations in your area that are trying to support these su- su- specifically supply chain um, and infrastructure building for regional meat supply. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's hugely important because, you know, people, I don't think people fully understand the hoops you have to jump through um, to put in place the infrastructure um, and then, you know, inspectors and all of that kind of stuff to be able to establish a meat processing facility. It's not something that happens overnight. A friend of mine out in Western New York, they just went live and it was a 10 year process. It was a 10 year process to get everything in all their ducks in a row in order to be able to get up and running. Um, it's, it's just amazing to me. And so, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there are a number of kind of mobile butcher shops that are, are, you know, that have, have popped up in our area um, in the last little bit that are kind of working under, you know, like deer processor type exemptions Mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, And, you know, so certainly there are a lot of people, you know, kind of going that route, but as, as somebody who is raising animals, I'm raising more animals than what I can um, consume myself. And it's a situation where it's like, I'm wanting to help other people have access to good food, um, mm-hmm. to high quality, good food. And yeah, for me, I, I can't legally, um, you know, kill the animal on my farm for that, for that individual. Uh, now they could come here and we could process it together, but not everybody has the stomach for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so to your point, there is a huge bottleneck when it comes to those kinds of things. And it's not even just whether or not you want USDA. It's if you want state inspected. Um, right. I, I dropped some turkeys off this morning uh, up the road to, uh, and I'm very lucky. That's another thing too, uh, in that I have a USDA processor about 10 miles to the north of me. I have another USDA certified processor about 15 miles to the south of me. I have a state inspected facility less than a quarter of a mile away. Yeah, well, from that's me. rare. So like I, am, yeah. I, I get that I am super, super blessed. And then, you know, I've got mobile processors, all kinds of great stuff. There are some people that they're having to drive two and a half hours one way to have yeah. chickens processed. You, you yeah. stop and you think what that adds to the cost already, if you're trying oh, to totally. pasture raise poultry. Mm-hmm. And then to add that on top of there, it starts taking when you're trying to provide good food to people, it really does start putting it out of reach for some people. Oh, totally. And that's, that's what bothers me. Totally. Well, one of the things I was trying to organize when COVID hit, and I'm just going to throw it down on your podcast so that other people can just figure it out wherever they are. But basically we were trying to do this thing called meet mutual aid, which was basically like it was for somebody exactly like you, you know, where you, you know, or a farmer that was farming commercially. And so we tried to, we tried to pilot it with a farmer that had like, I think eight rams that he needed to slaughter. And so we were like, okay, we'll get a team of people who know how to do it to come in and like kill those animals. And then we'll get a team of butchers separate from this kill crew who will cut the meat. And then, but the the kicker is like all the animals are going to be sold live to the customers in advance. And the price of the animal has to include the kill, the cut, and a a bit of padding for like admin organization and training because we wanted the model to make it possible for the the kill folks and the butcher folks to have people there learning from them so that we foment a greater work crew as time goes on and people who are, you know, making a per pound price for butchery or making a flat fee for slaughter, right? 
And so it actually looked like it was going to come together really great, especially for sheep, because we can like, it's a smaller animal. We can do multiple animals in a day. Mm -hmm. I think talking to some of the mobile slaughter folks that I've talked to around the country, it's really about like how many individual animals you have to do at one site in one day in order to get your profitability or your break-even point to the right place. Mm -hmm. So we had it pretty well figured out for sheep, which are quick because they're skinned, you know, and they're small. Whereas for pigs, if you're going to scald and scrape, it adds this whole other time component. And then obviously for cows, they're such large animals that it takes quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, But what was interesting is like, we ran into a bottleneck because the farm that we were working with was a nonprofit farm and they didn't want to accept the money from the customers for this scheme because they felt like it was too risky because we were essentially operating in a loophole because, you know, a lot of this is state law, but some of it is federal law where basically it's what you mentioned before. Somebody can come to your farm and buy a live animal and slaughter it themselves. But as soon as you help them, or as soon as they use your equipment, you become actually liable because you ought to be certified as a custom exempt slaughter facility if you are going to help them. Right. And so the idea was if the person owns a live animal, you know, um, and it's a cooperative where the, the kill crew, the butcher crew and the the consumers are all part of the co-op and they're all pooling their money to own the whole supply chain. Mm -hmm. Then we basically get around this little goal, right and we make it happen and then the meat's just distributed back to the people who own it right including the the butchers and the and the kill crew but the problem was like a nonprofit farm is you know was nervous about Mm -hmm. like accepting the money even though it really makes sense for the farmer the production side to receive all the money Mm -hmm. um and then to pay out to the contractors right who are coming to do the kill and the and the butchery but and I, I have confidence that this can that this can potentially work out, you know, mm-hmm. but we weren't able to um, to work ourselves past that little sticking point of mm-hmm. of the money. Um, and we tried partnering with a bunch of different organizations to make it happen. Um, and I do think it would have been easier with an individual farmer because they would have had no problem just being like, yeah, whatever, just pay me and I'll like pay mm-hmm. out to these service providers. Um but there's an idea for your listeners. And, yeah, no, I, that's you know. awesome. I, I, I mean, I, lo- I love those kind of creative ideas. Like how can we kind of, um, you know, Joel Salton, I think does the rogue food conference. It's like going rogue and kind of how can you utilize either loopholes or the law against itself uh, in mm-hmm. ways that you can advance um, the accessibility of good right. food to people. Um, right. and, and you're right there, there, it is bizarre f- from each state to each state, you're, you have different mm-hmm. rules and regulations. And then obviously you're governed by the, here in New York state, for example, um, we can process up to a thousand poultry on our farm and sell direct to a consumer, uh, every year. Now that poultry, that thousand birds includes, uh, chickens, um, turkey, um, I think waterfowl, um, even quail, I think is covered underneath that exemption. Um, but it's only a thousand birds. It's not a thousand chickens, a thousand turkey. It's a thousand total. If mm-hmm. you go above that, then you have to start taking your animals to a, uh, a state certified processor, mm-hmm. um, or a USDA certified processor, which for mm-hmm. poultry, that's even tougher to find. And, And so obviously if you start thinking about, okay, a thousand birds, okay, what's my profit mark? You know, like quickly a thousand birds sounds like a lot, but if you're Mm -hmm. trying to do this to make a living, it quickly, you just start running out of, right. Kind of out of room to make that happen. Um, But one of the other things that I found that was very fascinating is, and I I won't get into the long story of how I got into raising meat rabbits. Um, other than to say that my dad dropped off three rabbits that I was supposed to watch for 10 days and he didn't come back and get them for 10 months. And so (laughs) rabbits do as rabbits do. And all of a sudden I'm like, I've got all these rabbits, what am I going to do with them? And so I started looking into, okay, what would it take for me to sell rabbit meat? 
Now, rabbit mm-hmm. meat is not something that's very common up here in the Northeast that many people eat. Um, I think probably across the United States, that's it's true, but it's, it should be because yeah, it's so, so nutritious and accessible and easy, easy. Yeah. And yes, there's so delicious. Many great... Yeah. But what I found is that if I, I, well, I can process up to a thousand poultry on my farm and sell them direct to consumers. I cannot legally process one rabbit and sell them in New York state. That's because, really interesting because I thought chickens and rabbits were both under FDA regulation now. And I didn't realize there was like state. Yeah. I mean, I only know my own state at this point with respect to that, but. In New York state, it's considered a non amiable species and therefore it has to be processed at a facility. Yeah. And I know that the, like there are facility requirements, like friends that I have in North Carolina that raise rabbits, they have to build a specific facility on their farm that would meet, but it's much easier for them to meet those requirements for rabbit than it would be to meet it for beef, (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know, for example. So, so yeah, I don't know. And there are folks in New York state. I mean, I did a class, um, up in, uh, gosh, Essex, New York. Oh, okay. So that's just North Um, of me, just not too far. Yeah. Where they had built, and it was a facility that they had to build and it was a cost, but they had built a facility where they could butcher and, uh-huh. um, they were selling the animal live and then they were mm-hmm. slaughter and bringing it into their facility to butcher. I'm not sure if they're doing that anymore because they were having labor problems, but, um, and, and that's the other piece to it as well. I mean, we could talk all about the, you know, but that's another problem is there's, you know, well, everybody is struggling for labor right now. I mean, yeah. just about every store you go by has a, you know, hiring sign. Right. Um, certainly the, uh, the, the, um, meat processing, uh, uh, folks are not, uh, not immune to that. And it's, no, it's a skill set that, you don't just hire somebody in off the street and have them process it, having them processing animals tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it takes a lot of training. Yeah. It's, it's almost and as it's much really of hard. Art. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard work. It's not, it's not particularly enjoyable work. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know people who do it and enjoy it, but it takes a certain kind of person to really mm-hmm. fall in love with that kind of work, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's difficult. For sure. And, and especially, you know, I think, I think once the kill has been done and you're dealing with the meat after the fact, I think there's a certain maybe detachment that happens that you're cutting that up. Um, it's, you know, but, but for me, every time I go to do a, do the kill on an animal, it's a very emotional um, thing yeah. for me. And I've said, if I ever get to the spot to where it doesn't I don't want to use the term bother me, but that, that it, that, that, that I don't feel that level of emotion. That's yeah. the time for me to sell my animals. Mm. Um, because I, I don't ever want to lose sight of, um, what, what's taking place the, the fact right. that this animal is giving its life so that I might live. Yeah. And, you know, and so, you know, for me, and, and I'm sure that after a while, if you're doing it on a daily basis, there's probably a sense to maybe where there's a decent. I don't know, be, become desensitized to it and whatever, but, um, it certainly is, is something that, um, in my opinion, if you do it right, um, th- there's a sense of honor that you bestow on that animal. Um, mm-hmm. and, and certainly at a small scale level, I think it's much easier to do that than if you're doing that on a large scale assembly line, kind of a kind of approach. Um, yeah. And we have to think about the context that that large scale assembly line is set up in. It's set up in a context of demanding efficiency and, mm-hmm. you know, demanding the soullessness of the entire process, you know, mm-hmm. and I think, you know, if there's a book called On the Line, that's really fascinating. It's about, you know, Hispanic women working in the slaughter facilities and how how they bring meaning to, to the deaths that mm-hmm. they, that they experience, you know, and, and how they don't desensitize themselves to, I mean, that's just one part of it. There's all kinds of aspects to the book, you know, but I found that fascinating because that there's obviously a cultural understanding that they bring to that space so that they don't desensitize. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, you know, you're saying like small scale, of course, like that, 
provides a better environment for you to be checked into the process. But I think also like us retraining ourselves away from this like colonial mindset of this is how food has to happen. And, you know, blah, blah, blah is like another key and link to the puzzle of how we remain like alive to, to the world and like awake to the, to the fact that the animal is, is a living thing, you know? And so, so yeah, um, I think you're right. It's not supposed to be easy, <laughs> yeah. right? It's supposed to confront you with your own mortality. It's supposed to make you question, you know, your, your emotions in the moment, you know, and what you're projecting onto that animal and, and your discomfort and to sit in discomfort, you know, which I think is something that we really avoid in our culture uh, yeah, absolutely. altogether. Yeah. You know? And I think the other piece to it as well is, and again, understanding that not everybody has the, the um, situation that I have where they, sure. they can raise their own animals and so on and so forth. Um, but, but I think there is a sense to where when you are the person who is, is taking that life, there is a sense to where, and you're the person who raised that animal. There's a value that you place on that product that an mm-hmm. exchange of money will never, ever um, accomplish. Yeah, and I think you're right. You, you don't, you know, I don't, that, that's another part of the reason why, the, you know, the charcuterie thing to me is so important is because I want to use every, you know, nose to tail on a pig, on, I did an episode on chicken called beak to butt, um, like, you know, trying to, you know, utilize as much of that animal as possible yeah. and not allow anything to go to waste. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what, it's also about checking into life and death as like twin processes, you know, mm-hmm. like just to relearn and to re, um, to reculture ourselves. And I think for people who don't, this is what I love about fermentation and what's occurred to me about fermentation is like, it gives massive accessibility to even somebody who grew up like me or who's living like I used to in a very urban environment to start working with microbes, you know, which are like another, just another concentric circle of this, like, you know, system, this whole living system that that things are coming through, you know what I mean? So even if you're somebody who's never going to touch soil or kill a pig, or whatever, if you start checking into like what's going on inside a salami, you know, like Mm -hmm. we talked about it in class, so that huge rush of, of lactobacillus that's having a feeding frenzy on the sugar, and then it's dying, you know, in order to make way for these other microbes to come through and preserve. It's, it's a patterning of what's going on with the death of an animal. It's a patterning of what's going on with, you know, frost on the soil and then the awakening of the soil in the spring, you know? So I think it's like, you know, any way that we can sort of like get people back to the earth, you know, through whatever avenue Mm -hmm. possible, like that's all homesteading. You know what I mean? Even if you're in like a high rise in Brooklyn. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. 100%. You know, and that's one of the things I, I I say all the time. I believe everybody, I I believe everybody can homestead. I don't believe Mm -hmm. that homesteading is necessarily for everyone. Understanding that not everybody's going to have the same passion and interest that I do. But I really do believe if you're in somebody, you're somebody who's in a high rise in Brooklyn and, you know, you're interested in, in becoming more self-sufficient, self-reliant, you know, you're, you're on that journey, whether it's, you know, making sauerkraut or growing some herbs or whatnot, you're taking those steps um, in yeah. that direction. And I think and- that also goes back to how you learn and how the teaching is being done. Like, are we reskilling with an awareness of how important these processes are? Mm-hmm. And are we communicating the like living, you know, and cultural importance of those processes? Or are we just like mechanically, you know, being like, blah, 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 this is how you do it. Follow me for more. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think that that is really important. Yeah. 100%. Um, well, we could go on and on and on and on and on. I mean, it's, we should just, stop though. Yeah. 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 There is just so much great stuff that we could talk about. I mean, I would love to talk more about fermentation because you know, for me, actually, I came about lacto fermentation simply from a health perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, my my doctor prescribed me a probiotic pill, and I'm like, I don't want to take a probiotic pill. Where can I find probiotics naturally? Good and, for uh, you, because it, so many people don't like, understand that. You know, led yeah. me down a rabbit hole. So we could talk about that whole thing, um, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll close for now. And and so, thank you very much for for joining me here. I, I really have enjoyed this conversation. 
Um, you have some events coming up uh, this year. Um, is there any availability or are all your classes sold out? The only thing that still has tickets available that I would love to plug is an event in um, Preston, Maryland, which is kind of the mid shore area of Maryland, um, November 5th and 6th. I think we've got like five seats left in that class and it's the same class that you took. So two days full on doing lots of work, having lots of laughs, having lots of fun. Um, and then of course, like on your topic of fermentation and just sort of awakening to that, I have an online school called the fermentation school. That's kind of a cooperative online school. I have a lot of charcuterie classes on that platform. So people who can't take my class in person, the whole class, and then some, some of the stuff that we aren't able to cover in the in-person classes on the online courses. And then you can get you're in touch with so many other people teaching like how to make sauerkraut, how to make pickles, how to make cheese. Um, so check out the fermentation school. Um, it's just fermentationschool.com. Um, and you can start the journey. Awesome. And, and folks, um, I also highly recommend these two books by Meredith. So I have them in my hot little hand here. If you're watching on YouTube, um, I have links to those in, uh, I'll have links to those in the show notes. I'll have links to the, uh, to the fermentation school and also links to uh, merrilyfood.com where they can kind of keep track of events that you have coming up. I highly recommend folks, the (laughs) in-person charcuterie class is so much fun. And not yeah. knock it online. If all you can do is online, then do the online. But there is something about being in class, hands-on, but community. not just the community. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Connect. I mean, yeah. there were some, gr- I should say some great. It was a great group of people yeah. that we were able to connect with. And um, so thank you very much. You are my charcuterie guru and sensei. <laughs> and uh, so. <laughs> right on. Uh, I'll take so it, I thank guess. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really, really appreciate you being here and uh, all the best to you. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I am definitely hoping to have Meredith back on the program in the future to talk about fermenting um, because there's just so much great information that she has in that area as well. So thank you so much, Meredith, for being here on the program. I really, really enjoyed that conversation. If you have any questions about any of the things that we talked about today, uh, definitely feel free to uh, reach out to Meredith um, or you can reach out to me and I'll make something up. But the books that we talked about, the Ethical Meat Handbook and Pure Charcuterie, I will have links to those in the show notes as well as links to Meredith's website and especially the upcoming event that she mentioned. All right, folks, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for checking in. Brian can be reached by emailing him at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or by contacting him via our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support this podcast, we invite you to become a member of the Supporting Listeners Program. For $10 a month or $100 per year, you will receive access to a community of like-minded individuals via a private Facebook group, at least one monthly live Q&A with Brian, the opportunity to participate in live recordings of the podcast, access to an ever-expanding library of helpful homesteading content, and so much more. Head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net for more information and to sign up today. As always, the music on this episode was provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.